Alex Steele. Welcome to Bloomberg at Commodities Edge, where we focus on the companies, the physical assets, and the trading behind the hottest commodities with the smartest voices in the business. Let's get right to the data dig, where we take a look at some of the top market stories of the week. And I want to start with inventories, because there were definitely some bullish indicators. Uh, stocks fell more than expected, particularly in the Midwest in Pad 2. you got refinery runs are go going strong, and this time so is product demand. Gasoline demand jumped, diesel inventories fell, even jet fuel demand is now the highest since May 28th. Also, I love when the meme stock world hits my world. That's exactly what happened in the LNG market. This is Tellurian. Uh, you can see the pop in that stock at the end of May. So Sharif Suki is the co-founder and chairman of Tellurian. He was one of the first to see and invest in a U.S. LNG export market. And he's taking his pitch direct to retail investors as he battles what he calls a scourge of short sellers. You are our faithful investors, and you have also helped us get rid of the scourge of, or at least counter the scourge of the short sellers who are the true day traders who trade the same security 10 times a day. And you've made it very dangerous and very uncomfortable for them to be short the stock. And it kind of played out. I mean, you take a look at this orange line, that's short interest. Uh, sellers hold about 25 million shares, which is about 8.7% shares are short, uh, where the retail guys are making up nearly half. You got Reddit users creating their own forum for Tellurian. Even some YouTube content creators now have been talking up the company. And finally, it's been the story of the week. You got the metal crash. Look at this, all the metal really rolling over here. Uh, one potential explanation is China, which ordered state firms to do many things like curb, curb overseas commodity exposure, forced domestic banks to hold more foreign currencies, looked into a cap on thermal coal prices, limiting leverage, and selling metals all from state reserves. And that most definitely having an impact, particularly uh, when it comes to copper. So has the commu uh, commodity super cycle thesis hit a roadblock? Let's get into the ring and break it down. Is it a roadblock or is it a speed bump? Want to bring in Bloomberg's Joe Doe, who's all over this story. Which one is it, Joe? Probably a speed bump. I mean, obviously, the U.S. has been ramping up for a while here now. China, it's old news, right? I mean, they feel like they're, they're just way ahead of the game. But you're still looking at South America and Europe. They haven't fully reopened yet. So in terms of demand coming online, we could really see a lot coming on in that front. And also, I mean, look at the steelmakers. They already came out with pre-reported earnings yesterday, and they said demand's great. And we're expecting better demand going into the third quarter. So even in the U.S., there's room to grow. Probably what you're seeing right now is the Fed coming out and saying they're probably going to raise rates quicker than expected. And so you see a little bump up in the dollar. That makes commodities more expensive because of the price in dollars. Either way, though, China does not like this. China does yeah. not want super high commodity prices when they need those commodities. Can they actually influence the price like they did back in the last super cycle? Well, a trader told me today, of course they can influence the price. Look, they came out last night and said, we might release the strategic reserve. Um, we say we will do it, but are we necessarily going to do it? You've seen the way prices are impacted, machinery stocks, everything is impacted across the board. So of course they can have effect. I think the question is, will they actually follow through on that? We don't know. And of course, if you're a trader, a lot of those guys sitting out there saying, we'll believe it when we see it. We've heard them say this before, and they'll probably use it again at some point because they are truly worried about inflation of commodity prices. Yeah, look at the PPI for that. Joe, thanks a lot. Bloomberg's Joe Doe uh, joining me now. Time now for Commodity and Cheap, where we talk to one executive in the commodity world. Today, it's Dan Meyerson, Executive Chairman and CEO of Foran Mining. It's a copper conundrum. The world needs the red metal for things like EVs, smart grids, and solar panels. You know, the stuff that we will decarbonize the world with. Demand can actually grow at a compound annual rate of 3.2%. Now, that may not sound like a lot, but over the past 20 years, that number is actually closer to 2.2%. Bank of America still sees a deficit this year and next and sees the real prospects of a super cycle as this decarbonization push can offset any typical market softness and keep inventory low for years. So net-net? We need more copper. But mining isn't exactly super green. Now, you can do things like use renewable energy to power a mine or replace diesel engines and equipment for battery ones and use less water or recycle it. And all in all, copper isn't the worst offender. In the primary market, it emits just 3.95 tons of CO2 per ton produced. And total copper over all their emissions are just 1.5% of all the metals. Enter foreign mining. They still want to do it differently. 
It's a copper, zinc, gold, and silver exploration and development company developing the McElvina Bay project in eastern Saskatchewan. And they plan to be shovel ready this year. And it recently got a $100 million Canadian dollar strategic investment from Fairfax. Its goal is to be carbon neutral on day one and eventually be carbon negative. I recently spoke to the CEO of Foreign Mining, Dan Meyerson, and I asked him how he can possibly turn a copper mine green. Copper is really the key ingredient needed to decarbonize the world, yet producing copper or extracting it is one of the biggest carbon emitters in the world. So it's uh, kind of a large oxymoron that um, doesn't really make sense. So we wanted to solve that first, and we're really lucky. And I'll say that why, because in Canada, we have um, hydropower. Now, hydropower, obviously, as you know, is renewable energy. Um, and more than that, economically, it's one of the cheapest uh, sources of power in the world. So we're very lucky in that sense. And then we, we started thinking about how do we go about building this mine to be green, knowing that we have a major head start and that our renewable energy is a big source of the CO2 emissions. Um, and then we started looking further at technology and we started to see that a lot of the, the like battery electric vehicle technology and electric equipment was already there. Um, it just hadn't been really upgraded uh, to heavy scale mining activities. Um, however, in the last 12 to 24 months, all this has changed. Aside from the hydropower, for example, what are some of the specific nerdy things that you're doing okay. that's different so yeah so we started looking at um using hemp uh and in our dry stack tailings so dry stack tailings is not only one of the safest um methods for tailing storage but more than that by utilizing hemp in it it actually acts as a bioaccumulator for the heavy metals in the hemp which is obviously good for the environment but hemp is, is also a sequester of carbon so it's effectively carbon negative so we started bringing these types of things into the mix. And then we went a step further. We started looking at, you know, not just using normal concrete to build our infrastructure on surface. Um, we started looking at ways to utilize hempcrete instead of concrete or, um, you know, other forms of, of carbon negative uh, materials when we go into our construction phase. Can you actually be carbon negative? We think we can. Um, we have some ideas. Now, uh, we're trying not to talk about it too much because we're not there yet. Uh, so, um, yeah, I don't want to give away too much here, but we have got a lot in the works for this. How much more expensive is it to build it the way that you want to? We're very lucky in that our deposit is an underground mine. So it starts just 30 meters below the surface uh, and then you go down like that. So it's a much less carbon intensive um, process per unit of copper, but it's also a much lower upfront capex, which is a big thing in mining to maximize your returns. If you were to have built this mine the way you wanted to three years ago, how much cheaper is it today? A lot of, let's say the, the technology aspect, so let's, let's say the battery electric vehicles and uh, electric equipment, they simply weren't ready to be used in mining uh, two or three years ago. Probably you know, between 30 and 50% more expensive on some of the key equipment. Do you feel like your company will be able to command a bigger premium in the capital markets? There's a lot of pressure on a lot of institutional money managers today to only invest in the carbon neutral business. So for us, it's a very much a strategic and long-term approach that we don't want to limit ourselves to a certain pool of capital. We would like to be, you know, enable everyone to own us. If a mine wanted to retrofit its activity, or if another new mine wanted to start up, how, what kind of copper price do they need to see to do that more greenly? I think I think you'd be, well, I'd say not really for our mine, but I think the incentive price that's going to need, uh, that's, that, that, that is needed for the industry will be around $15,000 a, a ton in, in the near term. Um, so call, call that close to $7, $7 per pound. That was my interview with Dan Meyerson of Foran Mining. All right, time now for a commodity kicker. We know everything's bigger in Texas, and now including...
the temperatures. The Lone Star State is pushing homes and businesses to conserve electricity this week to stave off blackouts as a punishing heat wave bakes the western U.S. Now, the searing weather is the first heat-related stress test of the year for U.S. power grids and historic drought grips the western half of the nation. And that drought is having a profound impact on California as well as low water levels in key reservoirs reduce hydropower, which currently makes up nearly 13 percent of its electric power. It's all connected. All right, and what's on my radar for next week is I'll be moderating a panel at Bloomberg's uh, Qatar Economic Forum. I'll be speaking to Qatar's Petroleum CEO and Minister of State for Energy Affairs, as well as uh, Total Energy's CEO and Chairman, also uh, Shell's CEO, and as well as Exxon's CEO. It's going to be a heavyweight panel, so definitely don't miss it. That does it for Bloomberg Commodities Edge, and make sure to catch us every Thursday at 1 p.m. in New York, 6 p.m. in London.